calling for cloud now. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, hope you all had a good Easter and enjoyed the snow yesterday and all the shopping and haircuts today. <laughs> Jeremy, you're looking particularly cute, I thought. I told, I told you the story behind that. I, I, took a, I thought when I saw snow, I thought um, that's going to deter people so that the queues will be shorter. I might as well do it today, get it over and done with. <laughs> I think you got your money's worth. Um, <laughs> right. Very pleased to see you all. Um, tonight, um, our speaker, Ian Rotherham, is a professor of environmental geography and a reader in tourism and environmental change at Sheffield Hallam University. He's done a lot of broadcasting on radio and TV and has a regular phone in on the BBC, Radio Sheffield. He works regularly with many of the local communities around the area. His talk is about the transformation of industrial land, um, ex sort of coal mining industry, uh, into a thriving uh, nature reserve. And the success of this project has led to the creation of similar RSPB reserves around the country, usually close to urban centres like rain and marshes in East London, which our group has visited on at least two occasions, um, the Newport wetlands in South Wales, and also RSP, the uh, Sortholm in, on Teesside. So Paul Ian's talk, sorry, is entitled Dereliction to a Tourist Hub, the story of RSPB Old Moor. Ian, happy to take it away? Okay, that's fine, thank you. Can you all see that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Oops. okay, that's good. I will just get rid of that. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for the invitation to speak to you. I'm going to talk, sorry, that keeps coming back up. So I'm trying to get rid of that floating control. That should be okay. Okay, I'm going to talk about a site which means an awful lot to me. Um, I'm actually from Sheffield, I'm from South Yorkshire. Um, and I also spent, I, I went away to do my undergraduate degree at Lancaster, because at the time it was the only place that did ecology as a main degree. I came back to Sheffield to do a PhD in what was then the Department of Botany at Sheffield University. And I did research into invasive species. I'm, for my sins, I'm one of the world experts on the invasive rhododendron, the wild rhododendron. Mm -hmm. um, and this was before people really were bothered about invasive species. And it's still something I, I do work on. I, I actually do work on ring neck parakeets and things like that. And I have ring neck parakeets coming and feeding in my garden on apples. So um, we may talk about that later. So I came back to Sheffield. And then I was also very fortunate in being appointed as the first ecologist for Sheffield City Council. And I worked with colleagues across the whole of South Yorkshire. Um, and I did that for about 10 years. But in the meantime, when I'd come back to do my PhD, I got very involved in nature conservation with groups like the RSBB and with what was then the Yorkshire Naturalist Trust and various other sort of conservation bodies, because you came out of university and at that point, there were no professional ecologists, no professional conservationists. The RSPB had a few people, but they were mainly retired teachers who were very poorly paid as nature reserve wardens. Um, but there wasn't really a career in that sort of area. So I got involved in lots and lots of voluntary organizations Having left university and realised that I actually knew nothing about the real world and 
desperately keen to find some way of uh, discovering that. And whereas nowadays we train students who will then go out and work for the RSP, work for the Wildlife Trust, be able to plan a budget, be able to build a hide, all, all these sort of things. At that point, we didn't. There was no training of that sort. So I got involved in sites like um, what became Old Moor and a number of other sites across the region. If I wind back 10 years or so to the 1970s, I had my first acquaintance with what is now Old Moor. And I know some of you have been to um, Fairburn Ings, which was the first proper nature reserve I ever went to. When I went there, originally, it was Yorkshire Naturalist Trust. It had one hide. It had a boardwalk to the hide. There was a shed down the driveway as you went down to the nature reserve. None of the new visitor facilities existed. And the second time we went by, the first time we went, we had to walk over a derelict colliery site and a slag heap next to the river, got down to where the hide was and had a very exciting but very cold day and saw water rail. And I think we actually saw bitten as well, if I remember rightly, which was very exciting then. Um, second time we went, the local youth had burnt down the hide and burnt the boardwalk. Oh. Um, they're now much more robustly built and it's a fantastic site. The other nature reserve I went to was what is now RSPB Old Moor. We just did not have in the region, we didn't have wetland nature reserves. You know, things which the kids coming through today take all this for granted as they take national parks and green belts and things like that. Um, we didn't have any of that. And we certainly didn't have a nature reserve in the little town or little village of Wath, which is where RSPB Old Moor was. Uh, and you can see here the Humber Estuary, Hull, Barnsley, Doncaster, Rotherham, Sheffield, and there is Old Moor. My own background is that I have a big interest in peat and peat cutting. Um, in fact, the lady who asked me the question earlier on, it might have been the programme I did about two years ago on peat in horticulture and gardens with ITN, uh, which has been quite exciting because that seems to have changed industry policy and they're stopping using peat in horticulture, which is really, really exciting. But I also, my training is, as I said before, an ecologist and invasion biologist. But when I worked for the local authority, I started to realize that I, I couldn't understand the ecology and the scientists of history. And I got very involved with historians and archeologists in my work with the Peak National Park and with the city council um, to understand history. And I got very interested in researching where all the wetlands had gone because I discovered that I, I'd grown up in a landscape devoid of wetland nature reserves. And then I discovered that all across East Anglia, through Lincolnshire, into East Yorkshire and parts of South Yorkshire, in medieval times, there had been huge wetlands and they've all gone. And I kind of think, oh, where on, you know, what happened? Where, where did these wetlands go? So I did research on, uh, for a book called The Lost Friends, England's Greatest Ecological Disaster. I also did a little book on Yorkshire's Forgotten Fenlands, the Northern Fen, which is um, a huge area. We're talking the Southern Fen, somewhere like between 3,000 and 5,000 square kilometres. In the Northern Fen, something like two to 3,000 square kilometres of wetland. None of us here tonight has ever seen anything like that, and none of us ever will. I also then did some work on industrial landscapes, and I wrote a little book about industrial legacy and landscapes of Sheffield and South Yorkshire. So this was kind of where my background came in. And that we were also commissioned, because my other title, I'm Professor of Environmental Geography, but I'm also a reader in tourism and environmental change. And we did a lot of work for about 20 years on um, the impacts of organisations like the Wildlife Trust and the RSPB on triggering things like economic regeneration in the countryside and tourism. And I was asked by the lottery originally, and then by the RSPB themselves, to produce three major reports for the RSPB on the Old Moor site. And 2006, we looked at socio-economic appraisal, 
of investment by the Heritage Lottery Fund. And I'll show you what we did um, later. But the, basically the, the lottery invested nearly a million pounds in critical infrastructure to help the site be sustainable in the future. Because when you're creating sites like a nature reserve, you can often get capital. People give you money to build things. What is very hard is to get revenue to actually pay for the running and the upkeep. And with the lottery money, we invested in things like the shop, the garden centre, the meeting rooms, the cafe, the car parking, the toilets. And that generates income, which we'll look at later. Six years later, we were asked to update it and did, I did a report on transforming lives, the RSPB Durham Valley and the Green Heart Project. And again, I'll explain a little bit more about that. This was transformational for the RSPB. It's, this was something, the Dern Valley site was something that they had never done before. We revisited it again six years later and updated the economic and social impacts in order to support the RSPB in their subsequent phase of bids for funding. And one of the things that we were doing, or the RSPB was doing, was what it said at the outset that it wouldn't do. When they first looked at Old Moor, they were not interested, and I'll explain why in a minute. But one thing that they said quite clearly and very politely was, we're not in the business of changing lives, of transforming society. And what they've done here is they've transformed society, they've changed people's lives. This was one of the most derelict, um, desperate areas in the whole of Great Britain. And they've had a huge impact. 2018, what we were able to do was look at uh, census data, which we can now access online in great detail. And we can understand a lot about the economy, about employment, about health, about education, about well-being, et cetera, et cetera. And we can drill down and look at communities and see what changes that there have been. And we were able to help the RSPB present a case saying there is still a lot to do. We've done a huge amount, we've had a massive impact, but there is a lot more to do. There are communities who are still not engaged in what we're doing, this so-called Green Heart Project. So we'll come back onto that as we go on. But th this is what it was about really, it's, it's to do with people and nature, it's to do with removing dereliction and despoiled landscapes. It's bringing wildlife back. We've got bitterns booming again in South Yorkshire, which is absolutely tremendous. And it's connecting people and the younger generation to the wildlife. So fantastic wildlife and opportunities to meet it, see it, enjoy it. In the reviews, I managed to talk to various people like politicians and we got statements of support. I also had some contact with someone who some of you may remember. Um, it wasn't until recently the BBC folk musician, um, but also a very well-known comedian. Some of you may remember the Rochdale cowboy, Mike Harding. And I remembered Mike at a concert describing Wath Inns, as it was, um, as a sort of place that Hitler made on the way home. The kind of landscape that he had grown up in and he understood. Um, and I managed to contact him and said, would you say a few words for the RSPB about the work they've been doing? And he said, well, what things? It's a small but very significant move in repairing our damaged world. Well done, everybody. And a heartfelt thanks will be yours from the children of the future. Mm. And Mike is very involved in, in his other life. He's very involved in the Ramblers Association. So he does know about the outdoors and he's very passionate about it. Now, this isn't actually the first gentleman I met at Wathings, but it was pretty much like this. As about, I was probably about 17 and my friend and I, he had got a, a, a beaten up old resprayed post office Morris Minor van. Some of you may remember them. And we went, we journeyed. This is when kids didn't have proper cars. This was, this was exciting to actually have a vehicle. Even though on the back, we had a little sign that said, don't honk, push. Mm. Um, and we got there in our, in our beat up car and went to a little hamlet called Broom Hill and got out and obviously looked completely perplexed because we were in this flat landscape and everything was black. 
Now, Worth Ings, as I'll show in a minute, had been a medieval wetland, but in the Second World War, it became a coal, a coal storage area, a flat landscape where they just piled large amounts of coal for the energy requirements needed. And then that coal was cleared. It had gained a deep coal mine or two. It had gained a coking works, a railway, a massive railway siding, an industrial canal and everything else. And then this thing had just been kind of cleared and there were slag heaps and pollution. And we kind of got out of the car. We'd heard about this wonderful bird reserve called Wathings. And we were now in, if you, you may remember on old maps, people used to have things that said like ear be dragons. Well, this is how we felt. We were out of our comfort zone. And worse still, this very large gentleman, a very large motorbike turned up and we were thinking, oh dear, this is it. And he said, all right, lads, are you looking for the bird reserve? Um, it's just down there, it's about half a mile. Go down the flood bank, uh, I'll see you down there. And, oh, be careful with your car because it might be on bricks when you come back, but I'll see you in about 20 minutes. He turned out later to be, you know, within about 10 years ago, he became quite a well-known uh, birder and serious ornithologist, but we were absolutely petrified. It made quite a deep impression. And when we got to the actual nature reserve, across this derelict landscape, past where the visitor centre now is, we got to this group of equally substantial gentlemen sat out in the open on the flood bank looking at the the subsidence flash and they were recording rare birds and not only that they were staying out overnight during migration time to protect these birds from the local yobs who would go on there and shoot them and not only that these birders when they caught any of the local youth armed with air rifles and possibly even with shotguns, they basically duffed them up, took the guns and shot them in the dike. You can imagine that two posh kids from Sheffield were very impressed by all this. It was not what we were used to. Mm. The area also has a, a whole range of people who are passionate about this landscape. I mean, it's had a, a very mixed history for all sorts of reasons, but there are some people that you will be familiar with. I've actually had um, a fish and chip lunch with Brian Blessed, and away from the cameras, he's a very thoughtful, quiet, reflective individual. Um, when he's on screen, he is, um, yeah, he's, he's very good value. And this gentleman you probably won't know, it's the only picture I could find, I've got some pictures of my own on old slides, which I must get scanned. This is a gentleman called Michael Clegg. And Michael was a curator at York Museum and then became something of a celebrity um, on Yorkshire television, doing a sort of history, community and nature type um, documentaries, I suppose, going chatting to people and looking at the landscape of Yorkshire. And he was, he was desperately famous and he was very involved in the early days, trying to get the you know, War Things, as it was called then, recognised as a nature reserve. Because War Things was acquired by what was then the Yorkshire Naturalist Trust, and these were part-time conservation bodies, generally run by retired military people, so sort of major somebody or other, or lieutenant colonel somebody or other, who had retired from the military and went into nature conservation. That was quite a common way that these organisations were run. They had no idea how to deal with a bunch of uh, basically rough, tough teenage lads brought up in a mining area of South Yorkshire, but passionate birders. The York people had no idea how to relate to these lads, and these lads had no time for these rather, um, I think they thought, <laughs> rather snooty types from York. And Michael was quite instrumental in getting the site recognised as a nature reserve, really on the grounds of a few of the breeding wetland birds, but particularly for migrating wetland birds going through the valley. It's also the valley, uh, some of you may remember the film, Kes. This is where uh, Billy Casper, uh, Kestrel for a knave, 
and all that. And, and again, that captures the, um, the excitement, but also the depression of the community and also its connection to nature. Despite living in a, a terribly despoiled landscape, um, a lot of people had a very close passion for wildlife and for nature. I remember seeing my first sparrowhawk when I was out bird watching as a teenager in Sheffield. We set up a school natural history club and to see a sparrowhawk was really an absolute red letter day because they'd either been shot or poisoned with DDT. There's no buzzards, no peregrines, no uh, ravens, nothing. And I live on the, the outskirts of Sheffield now and I've had barn owls displaying over my garden. I've had red kites, I've had buzzards every day. I've got a sparrowhawk that comes and sits in the garden. And occasionally, unfortunately, it takes my nuthatch, which was a bit traumatic, uh, not just for the nuthatch, but for me as well. Um, things have changed, but we, we grew up in a, a terribly depressing situation. And of course, one of the films, again, that captures this for the, the Dern Valley area, close to where the nature reserve is, is Brassed Off, about the closure of Grimethorpe Colliery and the, the brass band, very poignant um, look at that. And the whole landscape, this is a picture of the River Don, the River Don, Dern, Rother, um, all come together. And this is the River Don in the late 1800s in central Sheffield. Absolutely desperate. And we now have Salmon Bank. One of my local newspaper readers, I write a local column for the newspaper, sent me some photographs about two years ago desperately worried because we've got two salmon that, had, that were dead. It found them in the upper reaches of the Don. And I emailed him back and said, don't worry, that's good, that's good news, they spawned. Most salmon, 99% of the salmon, when they spawn, die. So we've got them back spawning in the upper reaches of the Don. Fantastic. We've got kingfishers, we've got cormorants, we've got otters back. Where that bridge is, we've got otters now. But this is how it was in about 1900. The salmon of salmon pastures were dead. The river was hot because of the cooling water of the steelworks. It had raw sewage, the odd floating dead body, and chimney stacks pothering out absolute filth. Don't look too closely at the main picture there. That's a bit gross. When you take, when you create a wetland nature reserve or a countryside area, the first thing kids do is go in the water. And our main nature reserves, when they were set up in Sheffield back in the 1980s, still had raw sewage in the streams. Uh, absolutely depressing. And that was the first sparrowhawk that we had breeding, known to breed in one of our local woodlands when I was city ecologist. And our woodland gang came in about a week after we'd discovered it, almost in tears because some local youth had shot it. They are now quite commonplace and you see them in the city centre along with peregrines and other stuff. But I'm just trying to paint a picture of where we've come from with all this. Now that is where the visitor centre for Old Moor is, Old Moor House. That's Old Moor. And this is a valley bottom wetland. It's a moor, as in the Somerset moors and levels, not as in the Peak District moors. So it is slightly different. It's a, a lowland wet flat uh, moor. This is as it was in about 19 late 1930s. It's already got the uh, railway sidings and it's got the colliery and you've got the village of Wath. Wath upon Dern, the river being the Dern. And you can see there the nature reserve and the amount of urban development. It's kind of an overspill area. And with the restoration of the 1980s, 1990s, one of the things for the planners in Barnsley is they can't decide whether this is now greenfield countryside or whether it's post-industrial dereliction and in planning terms these are quite different things so it's caused them a little bit of angst. We can also look back um, into history these are um, tenancy agreements with the Earl Fitzwilliam our local landowner and here we have as a little insight into the people we're dealing with in Waffer Pond Earn, John Clegg farm labourer, Henry Firth, farmer of Wather Pond Earn. And it tells you how much they had to pay a quarter for the rental of their property. I think he was three shillings, he was one pound 11 and six. 
We also get some insight into this landscape from people like Ebenezer Elliot. This was, uh, he was in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and he was a little master, um, a metal worker from Rotherham and Sheffield. And he became famous as a campaigner against the Corn Laws. He was a campaigner against poverty and the repressed uh, workers, partly influenced by having seen, uh, he, he was quite posh, but he saw a school colleague when he was at school, uh, he saw this young man being whipped through the streets of Rotherham for some minor offence that had a deep impact on him. And he actually moves from Sheffield as a, as a man uh, in his later life, he moved to this house in uh, Grimethorpe or Briarley, Houghton, not far from the eastern edge of the uh, Dern Valley Nature Reserve. And he moved there because of the healing air. It was the most beautiful and the most beautiful sunset in the country. It was a fantastic. Way. So he left Sheffield and its pollution to go to Grimethorpe. Well, within 50 years, Grimethorpe had got a colliery, a coking works and the sunset and the landscape and its wetlands all disappeared. But he became a famous poet. He, he corresponded with uh, people like Wordsworth and others. He became a nationally not notable poet. He wrote about the River Don, like a weltering worm lies blue below and wink bank before me, rising green, calls from the south, the silvery rother slow and smile on moors beyond and meads between unrivaled landscapes. This is the landscape across the Don Valley down to the River Rother, south towards Chesterfield, which within 50 to 100 years became probably the most polluted landscape in Western Europe, uh, very close, probably following behind the Dern. He was a Corn Law Rhymer and he moved there to escape the dirty, dark, polluted airs of Sheffield. And Hargate House, where he lived, was described as, described as commanding a beautiful and extensive prospect of hills, woods, dales, and streams. And interestingly, Ebenezer Elliot used to skip school in Rotherham and go along the river Rotherham and watch the kingfishers. He was fascinated by wildlife and nature. And all throughout his life, he had a passion for um, both dealing with people and poverty but also uh, contact with nature and wildlife. And he lived in a landscape that we, it's, it's easy to forget was populated by people like clog makers for the emerging factories, older, older sold clogs. And the last charcoal man we know of in Sheffield in Parkwood Springs above the Hillsborough, Hillsborough football ground. And we have a fantastic legacy across South Yorkshire of ancient medieval bluebell woods. I'll show you a picture in a minute of the Dern Valley, but the settlements around it are medieval settlements or even pre-medieval. And the churches, it's got some wonderful old churches. And another nationally famous connection to Wath was a man called Keeble Martin, who wrote the concise British flora in color. It sold something like 100,000 copies in a very short time when it's published in the 1960s. He was a pioneering botanist and he was a, a vicar. And he got moved from places like Cornwall and uh, somewhere in South Derbyshire to Wath. And he'd been warned that Wath would be a difficult parish. The old vicarage when he arrived at Cracks, an inch wide from the colliery workings. The original plans from 1790 showed cellars for three kinds of ale and a brew house. So the vicar brewed his own beer um, which they often did and sold it to support the, uh, the church. Then in 1917, someone burnt the church down. It was a local boy with a grudge against the organ master. And he wasn't whipped, but he was sentenced to five years in the reformatory. That's our study area. And you can see the, the rivers, the network of rivers coming down from the high mm. ground of the Pennines here across towards Doncaster and out to the North Sea. Now here is the Dern Valley. And what I, all I want you to understand from this is the blue area is the floodland. And look at where all the settlements are, all the medieval settlements are away from the river, they're on the high ground. Because in medieval times, the wetland was very valuable 
it was your flood meadows and hay meadows. And also, if you built on a flood floodplain, as we were discussing earlier, you have a horrible habit of getting wet. Now, this is what that landscape would have looked like. When I was doing my Fenland research, I talked to people along the river valleys who either still had or they had family who used to have boats because of the frequency of the flooding all the way along the river, rivers Rother and Don, and Don, people had boats so they could get about when the river inevitably flooded. After the 1950s and big engineering schemes, everyone thought that had gone away and the rivers would never flood again. Pause for thought. Mm. And this landscape is fantastic. It's a wonderful area for things like grass snakes. And they often nest in people's compost heaps. The heat of the compost heap is what they need for their eggs. So if you live near to one of the rivers or the flood meadows, then grass snakes will seek out your garden to find uh, a suitable place to lay their eggs. And we have this network of rivers, the Don, the Rother and the Dern, forming these linear, um, urban, often urban wildscapes connecting um, ancient woodlands and other habitats across the whole region. And the actual weirs are some of our oldest built structures. So some of the weirs go back to about 12 and 1300. And they were hugely important for industry and commerce with barges sailing along the, can the canals and the canalised rivers, all the way down to Doncaster where the River Don goes past Conisborough Castle, the site of Ivanhoe and Walter Scott. Now, one thing to imagine is what this landscape was like. It's very hard because the past is being described as like a foreign country. It smells different, it sounds different, it looks different. We can't really imagine it. But just take the common eel, which the RSPB has been very involved in reintroducing to Old Moor and back into the new wetlands, which extend not just at Old Moor, but on a number of sites across the whole of that catchment. In medieval times, the eels were so abundant that when they were migrating up river, so they'd, mig they'd they grow in the rivers, then they migrate downstream and cross the Atlantic to breed in the Sargasso Sea, and then the young elvers come back um, and grow to adulthood back in the rivers again. But when they were migrating, the biomass of eels was enough to stop water wheels turning. Just imagine that. How many eels does that involve? And people pay their taxes to the church, their tithes in barrels of eels. By the 1980s, this once super abundant fish, an economically valuable fish, is virtually extinct. Just something to think about. These landscapes were hugely important to people, to local people. This is in the Yorkshire Fens, um, probably in the 16 or 1700s. The picture is from the late 1700s. Uh, and this is stout Yorkshire ladies gathering medicinal leeches to eke out their living. And you basically stood in the fen and the leeches bit and you pick them off and put them in a little barrel which you're holding in your penny. And that was very valuable. And leeches, of course, are still a very, very important uh, part of the toolkit for certain uh, surgery, like eye surgery. In Barker's Pool in the centre of Sheffield, a lady uh, cultivated medicinal leeches for Sheffield Infirmary, and she was selling them for £140 a year in 1836. That is a huge amount of money but that was selling leeches to the hospital in the centre of Sheffield. Now, there are other sites. If you come back up this way, go to the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust site at Pottery Car. This is just down the road, down the river from Old Moor, 4,000 acres. It was the biggest of the South Yorkshire cars. And it was drained in 1764 by John Sneedon, the man that built Eddiston Lighthouse. And that was described as having vast numbers of duck, bitten, rough, reeve, blacktail, godwit, marsh harry, great crested grebe, and water oil breeding commonly before Smeaton's drainage scheme in the late 1700s. So just a flavour of what's happening. 
we have a local phrase in Sheffield, South Yorkshire, that where there's muck, there's brass. I, where there's dirt, there's money. If there's no dirt, you're not making anything, there's no money. Now, the people that made the money were people like the Earl Fitzwilliam, and this was his house. This has the longest frontage of any house of this sort in, in Europe, I think. It's a massive thing, and it's, it's a weird building because it's got two fronts but no back. Um, and it's also here, these are white park cattle, but these are buffalo, North American bison. So that's where the money was going. And that's, he, as he saw, he was the man that they paid their rents to as farmers. And these people discovered that they got coal and they got iron. And we see a transformation from that medieval landscape, that rural landscape, that ecologically rich landscape to an industrial space. Industry, economy, society, landscape. There you are, Sheffield is a place to suit you. And we were proud of it. And we need to understand our history to understand how we are and where, you know, how we've come to where we are today. That's the center of Sheffield near where my university is in about 1900. And when I grew up in the 1960s, when you went to school, you got a yellow sort of gunk on your, your scarf that your mum put around your face. And we'd all got tonsillitis and bronchitis. It's hardly surprising. And the industry, this was a medieval deer park at Tinsley. And you can see there the spoil extending. That is about a half a mile across that distance there. Um, and these rural landscapes, that was on the floodplain of the Don Valley, they transformed in a matter of a couple of hundred years or so from a beautiful rural landscape to post-industrial dereliction. The industrial period lasts maybe three to 400 years uh, and then it's abandoned. And that landscape, believe me, is horribly, horribly contaminated. I'm not boring with the details, but we do have a legacy of heavy metals in South Yorkshire. Um, lead, zinc, cadmium, Iron Maiden, Saxon, various others. Um, but we have some of the best pollution in the world. We have the most polluted rivers. We have the most polluted lands. And that has been cleared. In the, the trauma, if you like, of everything that was happening, um, we also developed a very rich cultural tradition for both filmmaking and for music. Richard Hawley, the Arctic Monkeys, Jarvis Cocker, Human League, I went to school with Human League in Heaven 17. The Full Monty, Brassed Off, and many, many other films. And this is what the industry left. It left spoil heaps, it left dereliction. Because when the money goes, the focus moves off somewhere else. And very often with post-industrial situations, um, people just walk away. It's very strange. Daniel Defoe, you'll all have come across Daniel Defoe, and he wrote a fantastic travelogue in the 1700s. And he said, then so vast moors, I had almost said waste moors. We entered the most populous part of this country. I mean, of the West Riding, only passing a town called Black Barnsley. Now, interestingly, Black Barnsley was called Black Barnsley, not because of the pollution, but because of the extensive heathlands. The moors of the Pennines extended right the way down and beyond. And indeed in the 15th, 1600s, they extended the heaths, moors and woods and chase and forests and wetlands extended seamlessly almost to the East Coast from the Peak District National Park. So we talk about Black Barnsley and we think it means pollution and smoke and it doesn't. But my God, by the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s, this is what that verdant landscape had been converted to. Mm. A mixture of industry, and then when the industry left, horrible, horrible dereliction and pollution, and also a legacy of very invasive species like Japanese knotweed, Himalayan balsam, and of course, along the rivers, the otters had long since gone and replaced by mink. And the ecosystem services were broken, as we saw in 2007. That is not the River Don. That is the main road through the Don Valley in the catastrophic floods in the summer of 2007. And you can track these back historically 
Now, this is 1930s near Doncaster, and they say everyone had a boat. And all we'd done in the intervening time was actually make the situation worse. The ecological systems, the checks and balances, completely broken. That used to be a landmark uh, as you went up the M1 motorway towards Barnsley past Sheffield, Meadow Hall, or Meadow Hell, as some of us call it, um, at the bottom end. This was in a lake, a prehistoric lake, before it was drained. And I actually had a project to try and get a, uh, a camera on there for the peregrines that were roosting there. And we were going to have an offer if someone wanted to build a peregrine nest box. Mm. And we were going to put a camera to stream it from the nest box to the big screen at Meadow Hall. Because I thought, if you're going to get ordinary people involved in wildlife, this is a way to do it. And we couldn't get the energy company to do it because they wanted to knock the cooling towers down. We had various proposals for those. You've all come across the Angel of the North, a fantastic sculpture up near Newcastle. Well, we were going to do this as a giant set of flower pots with pl huge plastic daffodils in. That was one suggestion. Uh, and the other one was the flower pot men. Some of you may be old enough to remember Bill and Ben, the flower pot men. And we thought this could be a real iconic structure. Sadly not. The end comes in Wharf. You can see things happening in this wonderful landscape. It survives, a lot of it survives to the early 1800s. And you can see it changing with things like this. This is a, a share certificate for the Wath upon Dern Gas and Coke Company. That Isaac Brailsford of Wath upon Dern, uh, Draper, has a share, and it's the 1st day of January, 1844 the Wath upon Dern Gas and Coke Company. Because from the coal, from the coal, you would make coke. And in the coking process, you'd also make coal gas to supply to businesses and to homes. And this is the start of a hundred years of absolute horrendous pollution on a scale that we can only dream about. That was Wath main colliery. That's just one of the big collieries where the nature reserve now is. And another view of it there with the railway sidings and everything else. And nearby Wath Manvers, and you can see one of the big canals here as well. And then the canal. Sorry. And the railway sidings. I mean, a huge, huge area. And yes, it looks black partly because of the photography, but partly because in these situations, there is a pall of blackness. And for six days of the week, as in Sheffield, there's no sunlight because of the smoke. And on the seventh day, which was God's day, the factories shut down. And if the sun came out, you might see it. It was grim. And it bred a particularly tough lot of people. The other thing when you go to Wath is it's a little place, but in 1925, they had a sufficient population to support Wath Athletic FC. And they were playing Chesterfield FC in the Football English Cup tie, in the English Cup tie football match. So that population disappears when the mines close. But again, bear in mind that in the early 1900s, this was a populated area and they were up there with Chesterfield and other places. And there you are, there's a serious bunch of chats. There's some serious flat caps there. Yeah. That's the Wath upon Dern Miners Angling Club. They were serious about their fishing, and they still are. And that's the rescue team. Sadly, with the mines, not only do we get chronic disease, but we had some catastrophic disasters. And the rescue team would have to be ready and waiting uh, should the call come. You get some idea of what these landscapes are evolving into and just have at the back of your mind that vision of the medieval floodland, the wetland and the medieval church standing proud overlooking it. That's Wath, Maine in about 1960. And the nature reserve. So when you go to Old Moor, that's what, that's what was there. And you can see a little bit of landscape, still there's little bits of field systems and hedgerows, but stuff is suffering because the, 
the muck that's kicked out, not just into the ground, but the air pollution from these things is absolutely dreadful. So just to finish the first part of the presentation, the second part is much shorter. I just want you to think about the consequences of deep coal mining. The first one is desiccation. You lower the water table. You can't deep mine. The first coal mining in the region occurred in the Peak Park, as it is now in the Pennines, where the coal comes to the surface. The rich coal seams are deep underground, but you can't get them until you've got steam pumps to pump water out. Because if you go into a deep coal mine, to a deep seam, you fill with water. When you pump the water out, the whole landscape dries up, and we actually have records of uh, the wetlands, such as at Grimethorpe, very more, just dries up by the end of the 1800s. Then you, you're digging out the coal, but you're also taking out what we call overburden, the non-coal material, which goes into the slag heaps. And they weren't very good at putting it back. So you leave a hole in the ground and you get a subsidence, which is why uh, Reverend Keeble Martin found that the vicarage was basically falling apart. There were big cracks developing down the walls because it's sinking. The result of all this industrial activity is dereliction and pollution. And by the 1960s, 1970s, the whole economy is, is hitting the buffers big time. The first thing has been employment, that the industry has generated tremendous employment. It's drawn people in. A lot of mining communities come in from Scotland, from the northeast of England, and from Wales. And there's still parts of South and West Yorkshire where if you go into particular communities, they've still got a particular accent, say like a Geordie accent, from when the miners came down in the early 1900s. And we have what we call white city estates, which are miners' estates uh, in some of these areas. And these were kind of dumped into the rural landscape. So you get a boom of employment and then suddenly catastrophic unemployment, particularly in the 1980s, 90s, when the mines close very abruptly. And you're left with a situation with terrible health issues, horrible health issues and economic collapse and total despondency. That's the River Dern, that's the Upper Dern, not the Lower Dern where the nature reserve is, but that water really is black. That's in the 1980s. Um, that's not light or shade or whatever, that is just black. The river is dead, the river is black in colour. And you can see there what it's done to the trees and the rest of the landscape. We managed to rescue the, the kind of wider area, it was all going to be open cast, but we managed to stop that, but it's horribly, horribly polluted. So what then happened, we're taking this gorgeous landscape, part of the fantastic fenland, the upper edge of the South Yorkshire fen, as to say two to three thousand square kilometres of wetland, species rich. It's discovered as a mining substance flash in the 1950s. The predecessors of the, the people that I met when I went there in the 1970s. The Yorkshire Naturalist Trust, as it was then, were persuaded to actually acquire what things the derelict site as a nature reserve. Very, very uh, ambivalent about it because they were not used to buying derelict sites or dealing with this sort of community. Nature reserves were supposed to be nice places, not rough, tough, dirty, polluted places. The Yorkshire Naturalist Trust became the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and they and Barnsley Metropolitan Borough Council started with help from Rothenborough Council, started to plan restoration of the site. And they got a grant called Derrick Land Grant to actually clean it up. And they got money from the EU, the Coalfields Fund, to invest into Coalfields areas. And by this point, the whole of that area, South Yorkshire was objective one in, in the European Union. That is the poorest category, only South Yorkshire and Cornwall received objective one status. And this was one of the two poorest places in objective one. So we are talking about a really bad, bad situation. The original player coming in was the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, who, if you remember, set up the London Wetlands Centre. And they were the ones coming in to develop Old Moor, and then they pulled out because they got London, they felt they couldn't manage to. 
the RSPB, interestingly, turned down, very politely turned down the opportunity to get involved. And they said, we are not really in the business of transforming lives. We're not in the business of tourism, particularly. We're in the business of conserving birds. And then some of the local people who have kind of grown up in the area with me, um, who knew the landscape, started to put together a case. They were now working for the RSPB, but they put together a case that showed that the wider landscape of Old Moor and the Grimethorpe Wetlands, Edithorpe, Flash and the others, actually had a nationally significant population of things like lapwing and snipe. And that was the trigger for the RSPB to get involved. Now in the second half, I'll talk a little bit about what they've done and how important that's been. One of the things that brought people in was the attraction of the migrating birds and the wintering birds, things like the plots of golden plover and lapwing and starling, huge numbers. You're talking, you know, a thousand golden plover, 3000 lapwing, stuff like that, absolutely amazing things. But they weren't at Old Moor by this stage, they were at Broomhill Flash which had been a private shooting lake and then some locals took it over and they, they stopped the shooting and they built a hide and they get, got lorry loads of potatoes and things and just dumped them on the land for the birds, the geese and stuff like that to come down and feed on. And that again was one of the things that triggered the recovery and the interest. But it was a nationally significant population of what is now a declining species, the lapwing, that really uh, made the difference. We'll just take a, um, a 10 minute break and then come back for a, a shorter second half. I, I don't know, does anybody want to ask any questions now or do you want to save it to the end? Right, I'll, I'll, I'll um, pause the recording now. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, thanks. Okay, welcome back. This is what will greet you if you go to the Old Moor Wetland Centre today. Um, and it's, it's almost unrecognisable as a landscape from those images which I showed you right at the end of the, the first session. It's a landscape transformed. It's a community transformed in many, many ways very extensive habitat creation. This began life as a few um, mining substance flashes that were recovering from the, the drainage and the desiccation of the medieval wetland. And they left a legacy of horrible dereliction and pollution. And that's what was then remediated uh, and cleaned up and a new landscape designed specifically for birds, bird watching and nature. To bring back habitat for these wonderful species of our lowland wetlands and the marshes and floodplains and rivers and canals. And not only that, into this area, we have colonizing roe deer, for example. They're, they're in the heart of Grimethorpe and Barnsley and Sheffield. During lockdown, we had Munchite deer right in the middle of the city, roe deer right in the middle of the city. We even had a badger going into the Sheffield Midland Railway Station, famously captured on video. But in the nature reserve and around the Durham Valley, roe deer um, you know, really love that habitat. They're really at home there. And what the RSPB has done at Elmo is to provide wildlife with what I call the wow factor. If you're trying to get birders to go and you're looking at local people as well as um, keen birders and twitchers, you're wanting a number of different things. You want really nice, you know, sort of common species that you just see, which is what most people love to see, the blue tits, great tits, woodpeckers, and the, the, the typical wading birds like lapwings, etc. You also want for the, the real keen bird watchers some rarities, and Old Moor is a fantastic list now of really rare species that will get people traveling a distance to come and see them. And then you also want birds with what I call the wow factor. 
Well, whether you're a bird or two or not, when you see them, you just stop and you go, wow, that's fantastic. And into that category come things like migrating ospreys and also increasingly prevalent red kites. But you're creating a, an environment where people feel interested, excited, safe, and where they're going to have a, a, a lovely experience, a day out or a half day out to walk. Um, so you're looking at walkways, you're looking at environmental sculptures, you're looking at designed big habitats, you're looking at designed little bits of habitat to go with them. And it's not just the birds, it's all those spectacular wildlife species like southern hawk or dragonfly. You know, eyeball to eyeball with a dragonfly is a fantastic experience and kids are just as excited by meeting a dragonfly, having a dragonfly land on the hand or something as seeing a rare bird. And one of the things that we did at Old Mall was to invest the, the lottery, put in over a million pounds. And that was specifically not for the cleaning up of the site, not for the main infrastructure, but for things like the cafe. So the Gannett's Cafe, the shop, the garden centre, um, the offices for rent, etc., etc. And there's a number of things happening. One was that they're creating opportunities to spend at the nature reserve. And the nature reserve is now pretty much self-financing, which is just amazing. But also the nature reserve itself was a trigger for investment for companies relocating, relocating to the now cleaned up Dern Valley, the now landscape Dern Valley, the Dern Valley now with new transport infrastructure and relocating there because they've read about it in Birds magazine. And they say, oh, it's not that bad up north. Let's, you know, we can relocate. We can go to Bali. It's got good access to the motorway. And it's next to this fantastic nature reserve. And, you know, we can, when we've got a business lunch, we can go down to the cafe, which is what people do. So we have that. We have people wanting to live there who would not have lived in that valley 30 years ago. And they are coming there in part because of RSPB. So that's been hugely, hugely important. And is the, the lottery fund was the, the icing on the cake. The big, you know, there's big money went into to remediating the dereliction, but that doesn't give you a site that's actually going to um, bring in tourists, bring in bird watchers, bring in local people for their day out. That's what the lottery did. And when there's a few local birders and the site has first been established, it's attracted probably about two to 3,000 visits a year. And they're mainly repeat visits by a few local people. When the RSPB took it over, um, around about the late 1990s, they were getting about 10 to 15,000 visitors a year. After the investment by the lottery fund, that figure immediately jumped up to about 50,000 a year and it's grown now to over 100,000 visitors a year. Many of those are tourists. And we've now got hotels opening, restaurants opening, cafes opening, when this is possible before COVID, of course. But in a valley where there was no, no, you couldn't stay anywhere, you couldn't go and eat anywhere, there was nowhere there to provide for that. If you wanted to visit the Dern Valley, you'd have to stop somewhere else. But the RSPB were there has transformed that situation we've now got a booming tourism industry. And I have to say, if, if, as a, if you said in the 1970s when I first went there, that you were going to Dern Valley for a tourism day out, they really would have locked you away and thrown the key away. You know, it's just, it was just unthinkable. But that's what's come of it. It is now a major destination. There are the reports I mentioned and they are downloadable from my website. If you want to be thoroughly bored, uh, they are in great detail, and I've just took out, taken out a few bits to give you an idea of what sort of things we looked at. Dern Valley became one of the government's nature improvement areas, so it got enhanced funding for about three or four years to help this process of transformation. And we looked at, as part of our research, um, for example, we looked at accessibility. So who could get there, how would they get there, and how long would it take them? So that's quite important when we're dealing with it. We looked at things like deprivation. Don't look at this too, in too much detail, 
but those are um, data collection areas and you can drill right down almost to your street with the data sets we've got now. Um, but they are re it's really useful. You can get data on social and economic and health issues. And we can then build a picture of A, what the need is, and the red bits are not good. And that is where we are here. So there's some pretty poor areas around there. But also you can see over time from examining the data sets, whether you're having an impact and whether you're transforming that. So are you getting a bang for your buck? And what we can show with the RSPB is we're getting a really big bang. So that is great news. And there's also a design aspect to this is a central green hub, which is the nature reserve and some surrounding uh, other wetlands. Because the bit that you've seen if you visited is only part of it. There's a lot more that the visitors tend not to see. There's a huge wetland that Houghton, Grimethorpe, where Brastoff was, is up there. And this was a huge wetland called Ferry Moor. At the end of it, up to the 1800s, there was a cheap Barnsley ferry, which was a, where a man carried you across the marsh, piggyback ferry. Uh, and that dried up by the end of the 1800s because of deep coal mining. But it's now re-wetted. It's a huge area. And then we also look at things like the expanded concept for what started as Old Moor, Waffle Pond and there, is the Green Heart Project. And the idea of that is taking this really deprived community and linking into things like the Trans Pennine Trail and other long distance routeways and a network of other nature reserves to really get to the heart of local schools, local communities and local people and get people um, active in the landscape, actively bird watching, dealing with nature therapy, you know, the healing quality of the green gym, working on the nature reserve as volunteers, et cetera, et cetera, and it's transforming lives. But what we can also show are the pockets where we're still not reached, because some of these are quite hard to reach communities. So we've got loads and loads of information, and it's been quite a, uh, a process over the years to document this. And then as I say, dealing with things like green infrastructure, terribly boring terms. But what it means is that the nature reserve network there when we had the catastrophic floods in 2007, 2013, 2019, and when the next lot come, the nature reserves actually mop up a huge amount of the flood water and they deliver services. And we were able to actually value what those services are worth. Now it's not real money. No one's gonna come along and say, here, RSPB, here's 20 million pounds for all the good you do. But it just means we can show to government, to decision makers, the actual economic value of what the RSPB and its partners have been doing, and it is huge. So that's the Green Heart Project. Um, and there's been all sorts of different phases of funding to develop that and the education work. They're doing you know, active education work into local schools and colleges, getting kids to come and volunteer, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a huge amount of activity. We say what people want, if, you, if you're going to get people to come to these sites, you want to have something that is reliable and spectacular. Now, the problem with reliability is that you know as bird watchers that sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. But as long as you get something, so if you don't see the peregrines, well, maybe you get the, the starling flock. If you don't see the starling flock, maybe you get the golden plover. As long as there's something, and you can guarantee with Old Moor, there's always going to be something happening, something exciting. And the other thing that we've managed to do is to get a lot of really good publicity for the RSBB through the media interest. We managed to get uh, Autumn Watch, for example, when they came up to Sheffield, I managed to get them to go out to uh, Old Moor as well. So things like that, which are worth a huge amount. And that is actually, it's not just worth a lot to the RSBB, it's worth a lot to those communities and it's worth a lot to that economy. And I like this because this, this was sent to me by one of my readers in the, with my newspaper column. And people send me their fantastic photographs, better than my pictures. And then they're really pleased if I use them. Um, and they had these two male kingfishers battling on one of our local rivers. These rivers, which until the 1970s were biologically dead. And we've now got kingfishers right in the city center and all the way along the Dern. Um, and then the victorious male went and mated with the female. And I just thought that took me back to 
uh, Ebenezer Elliot bunking off school to go and look at kingfishers along the banks of the, of the robber. And we've got other species that have come back in, Mediterranean gull. I think they've bred at Old Moor. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. Uh, little gull. Black tern come through. Common tern breed them. These are all things which 30, 40 years ago would be absolutely outrageous. And one of the birds that is symbolic of that site is the tree sparrow, which of course now is quite a, a threatened species, but that's one of the places where you can still go and see flocks of tree sparrows chirruping away and you can get good use of them and show them to kids and to passers-by. And it's just fantastic. So it doesn't need to be absolutely rare species. It can just be nice species that maybe we've lost from other places. And things like sand martins. I had a, a flock of about 30, 40 sand martins go through the other day. And that's fantastic. And they're back and they're breeding along the Dern. They're breeding along the Rother. Uh, they're breeding along the Don. And that, again, is absolutely wonderful because they're an interesting bird. People stop and look at them and, you know, they, they grab people's interest. This is the last of these sort of more technical diagrams that I'm going to show. There are lots and lots in the reports. Um, but one of the things we were interested in was how has the work in the Dern Valley impacted on membership of the RSPB, which of course is one of the things that the RSPB headquarters are interested in. And one of the things it does show is that although Barnsley is quite a deprived area, um, it's got a disproportionately high um, level of RSPB membership. So there is some payback in terms of members and members' fees. The other thing I would say for the RSPB is that if you have a site and it becomes an RSPB nature reserve, that is worth a huge amount because you get people like you guys going along on coach trips and the like to visit. So you've actually kick-started a tourism economy just by being an RSPB nature reserve. And the one where that failed, the site I used to know very well, at Hornsey Mere, on the East Coast lost its RSPB status and had a huge problem. And that actually affected the centre of Hornsey. It had a bad effect on tourism to Hornsey, not being an RSPB nature reserve. And as the landscape and the environment have cleaned up, people now get a chance to see birds like the heron. If you are on the high street of Wathorn Dern, or if you're in the centre of Sheffield, and look up, you will see buzzards, red kites, sparrowhawks, peregrines, and herons. Absolutely amazing. They were not here 30 years ago. The rivers were biologically dead. And yet now you can, you can go out and you can share that with people. And we've got avocets breeding. I mean, who would have thought that we would have avocets back breeding in a fairly urban part of South Yorkshire? And of course, the bitterns, absolutely fantastic. Uh, nearby Pottery Car in Doncaster, there was a folk rhyme before the bitterns became extinct there, and have come back. When on Pottery Car, the butter bumps, i.e. the bitterns cry, the women of Bulby say summer is nigh. And the bitterns are back, which is absolutely amazing. And of course, with a site like this, you're getting breeding birds, you're getting wintering birds. So you want all year round stuff for people. I mean, a lot of people go to the cafe and never get beyond looking at the reserve from a distance. And we don't mind because they're spending money. If people come and sit in the cafe and restaurant, pay their money, they buy something in the shop and they enjoy being at a nature reserve. It doesn't really matter if they go in or not. For those who are going there regularly, they want to have something every time of year. And of course, part of that is a migrating birds. So if you get the herondine flocks like the swallows and martins, then you'll probably get hobbies coming in as well. And of course, with all the dragonflies, the main thing that hobbies eat is dragonflies, big fat bodied dragonflies. So the circle goes round. And I think what the RSBB done is, it's been transformatory. It has been absolutely amazing, especially bearing in mind that when we started out, they said, the one thing we don't do is transform people's lives or transform areas. This was the first one they did like that. And I know they've rolled out the idea to elsewhere and I think good on them. It is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it is it's not easy. 
it is hard work. Some of the communities are what I call hard to reach communities, but some of them are actually sound as a pound and it is brilliant. Um, and because the nature reserve is now an economic hub, those local communities value it even more. So I think, again, that's something that uh, should be borne in mind. There's a lot more information. That's my research website. Those reports I mentioned are on there. Uh, and there's also my blog, which you might find quite interesting. Uh, it has some edgy stuff. I do my conservation stuff. I support a lot of conservation projects and people campaigning to safeguard their local patch. So some of it is a bit edgy. It is a bit political. And then some of it is just nice wildlife -y stuff. So if you get a chance, have a look at that. And I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much. So, 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 does does anybody have have any any questions? Um, for Ian, um, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps I'll, I'll I'll start. Um, 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 I, I, I've read somewhere that um that um some 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 of the volunteers at Oldmore or and maybe some of the other reserves there um are, are kind of ex ex um um ex um coal coal miners and, and yeah. I just wondered whether whether there are any any stories of you know particular I think the, the only stories I could give you with that I mean yeah. the, yeah. some of the people have come in and ended up working on the reserve they were passionate the guy that ended up running the reserve at one point had just come from local business. He wasn't from a, a nature conservation background at all. Um, and he came in and they trained him up. They, they made a, a big effort to employ local people. That was one of the key things about the project. Because if you're looking at economic impact in a situation like that, somewhere like the Dern Valley, as it was, and Wath on Dern as it was, is what we call a leaky economy. So if you spend £100, Within one spending round, ninety-nine pounds of it goes out and elsewhere because no, you know, nobody um, that, that the money's going to actually lives in the place. Wath was such a desperate sort of place that you, you wouldn't want, you wouldn't choose to live there unless you'd grown up there. So it's a leaky economy. It doesn't. There wasn't much um, in the way of a supply chain of people who could provide material for your shop or your restaurant, your cafe. And they've made definite, they've made real efforts to work with, say, local farmers to, su to supply into the cafe, to work with local services to provide what the RSPB needs. And that took quite a big effort over a number of years because the, the stuff was just not in place to do that. Mm. But I think, I think that has had a big impact. You know, people appreciate it. Local people are incredibly proud of what's been done. And I say the whole thing started were those um, lads who were from a mining background, the, the ones at what things that, that discovered it all. And they, they were absolutely fantastic. You know, um, unbelievable, I thought. You know, they, these guys, they just say so they, they camped out without tents. They just lay on the, the canal side overnight to protect the birds from people persecuting them. And if it hadn't been for them, we wouldn't be talking about this now. That's where it all started. And I just, I just, at the time, I was blown away by that. I just thought this is amazing. The, the other thing was that they, they subsisted on co tins of cold baked beans. Oh. And much as I love baked beans, I thought cold baked beans is just, it is, <laughs> you know, that is quite a, an amazing achievement. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, can I ask you that? Yeah. Um, do you think the RSPB have now changed their kind of um, objectives in the sense of taking a bigger interest in the effects of reserves and so on on local communities? Absolutely. I, I mean, they they started back in the 1990, late 1990s. There were two people. There's a guy called Matthew Raymond and a guy called Ian Dickey, who are both active as economists, but I think they now work for consultants and they did some of the first studies ever on the economic value of nature and bird watching and they start off with studies of things like the ospreys in scotland lock garden and stuff like that now i can look at some of that stuff you can pick holes in some aspects of it but it was groundbreaking at the time 
And what they were trying to do was get a message across to decision makers, to government, to politicians, that we're not just dealing with something that's nice, we're dealing with something that actually has huge economic value. And this was particularly at a time when people were looking at how do we rekindle rural economies, and particularly through tourism, in a new, a new kind of economic paradigm, if you like. Um, and that, the, the RSPB was absolutely central to that. Now, I think they, they, were, they were demonstrating the worth of what they did, but they still felt that their main mission was conserving bitterns and conserving avocets. And that's fine. I understand that. My argument with them and with the Wildlife Trust, particularly, as it was always, well, you're having these effects. Surely you, you just want to A, shout about it, and B, maximize the benefit because you, you're having an impact anyway. There are ways that we can actually improve this. We can actually give you more bank free book and, and you, you will benefit. If you educate the kids now, if you invest in education and you get kids coming to the center, those kids are spending money. If those kids enjoy it, they will bring grandma and grandpa back at the weekend or mum and dad back at the weekend and they will spend money. They will want to buy your binoculars. They will want to buy your bird seed. Oh, and you've got a new generation of bird watchers. So, you know, we say that this actually makes sense for everybody. And yes, in these, these communities like Wathan Dern, it's going to be difficult. It is challenging. But at that time, a lot of opportunities arose, you know, money to clean the site up, money to do the landscaping, money to design it. And also there's a transformation in the, the transport structure. So people could come in off the motorway very quickly. It used to be a very windy road. Um, and now you could get straight in there. And the clean at the valley and there's new communities residing there. So you've got a new sort of population who are within the demographic that the RSPB membership will, will be. So there's all sorts of things. I think, and I think the RSPB over the time, at the time when it started, they were really very, not lukewarm, but I think nervous. I think they were genuinely not sure that this was their, their thing. When I talked to the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, they always saw themselves as a tourism organization. Whereas a lot of people I dealt with with the RSPB in the early days, I accepted visitors, but reluctantly. A lot of the wardens, for example, loved to talk about rare birds, but what they really wanted was to be out there on a quiet afternoon watching the birds. Mm -hmm. They didn't want hordes of visitors, particularly. Whereas the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust always viewed themselves as delivering a tourism experience. And those are kind of poles apart in terms of um, approaches. And I think the RSPB has, has now struck a really good balance. And I, th I think they, they deserve absolute plaudits for this. I think it's been, as I say, it's been transformatory. So why did WWT pull out? I think merely because, I mean, at the time, there were two things. I, I actually got called in to do an environmental assessment of, believe it or not, an airport that was going to be built very close to this. Um, and the people, it's only going to be a smallish airport, but it was an airport. And we did have to point out, not only were they going to impact on some very nice bits of habitat, ancient hedgerows and things, but also, do you realise there's going to be a big bird reserve near here, which is not what you want next <laughs> to an, air, an airport. Um, and I think WWT basically went for the London Wetlands Centre big time. That was their big investment. And that really took all their resource to kind of focus on that and deliver it. And they just felt they couldn't have something equally as challenging up here in Barnsley. So they pulled out. And I say at that point, the RSPB were not really on board. And the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, as they were, not as they are now, I mean, they're now a different organisation, but as they were, they probably weren't geared up either to take this on on the scale it, it is because the whole complex of sites I mean, the bit you see when you go as a visitor is just part of it there's a lot more to the entire nature reserve and there are schemes to to re-wet grasslands and uh, have conservation grazing and all sorts of on quite a wide area and it's a big big task and that really you're looking at a big organization like the rsbb as being almost the only one that could do it 
But would they be able to do such things without the um, academic expertise from people like yourself or local uh, universities? I think, uh, yeah, it's difficult. I, I think they do because they have, they have the ability to buy in what expertise they need and yeah, fair say, I said with, with the economists, they actually that they Matthew Raymond and Ian Dickey were, were RSPB headquarters staff, so they they've actually been in a position, a very fortunate position, unlike a lot of organisations, where they could actually lead on research, and then they can work in partnership with academic bodies and government agencies and the like on an equal footing. Um, so they and I, I think they show great vision in that the, the work that. Matt and Ian did, I think, again, had a huge impact because they produced very nice reports, which are still available. You can still find them online. There's a whole series of reports they did on the economic value of bird watching and of birds at a time when nobody had really thought about that. So governments might say, yeah, it's a nice thing to have. But, you know, if it's it's not real jobs, is it? It's not real economics. You know, it's nice to have birds, but, you know, really, at the end of it, we want industry. Whereas, actually, what the RSPB was saying, well, look, you know, this actually delivers economics. This brings investment. You know, we can show. And we went out and interviewed people in businesses. And we went out and talked to things like estate agents and looked at the impact on house properties and what we call the desire to live somewhere. And it just... It, it just changes completely with the RSBB and the other one nearby I mentioned was the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, Pottery Car. They have a massive impact on people's perceptions of an area. Because at one point, if, if a business was relocating, say, as a lot of business of, as businesses have had to do for, for economic reasons, was relocating, say, from the southeast of England, say, from London, then you tell the staff we're moving to Barnsley and they've, they've all left the building, you know, they, they don't want to, but actually what this does is, is, is change people's perceptions. The, near, near to Pottery Car, which is not far from here, there was a, a, a very upmarket housing development with a, a wetland, and it's an artificial site, it's a big round sort of uh, water body called Lakeside, and it's near to Pottery Car and it's near to Old Moor. And those houses were sold before they were built. You know, the desire to live there with the transport infrastructure that they've got and near to this fantastic wetland and near to the nature reserves. And it's just transformed people's um, opinions and visions. And one of the other things, I mean, the two other things that we looked at, there's some very interesting work on the economic value of things like nature reserves and nature for education, for delivering... Um, I always want to call them O levels, but I'm that generation, A levels and uh, university degrees. And places like Old Moor have a huge financial benefit to the country in helping to deliver education. And we can actually put a value on that. And it's not small, it's, it's big money. And then the other one, of course, is health benefit. And the one issue, I think, the weakness in that is that when the, the key work was done that showed having contact with nature. And that, I mean, this has come up with COVID as a huge, huge thing. The contact with nature improves people's mental and physical well-being and health. And that is worth a fortune. I mean, there's, you know, it's a well-being thing as well. It's also worth a fortune to the NHS because it saves the government money dealing with the other, other health problems. And the weakness in that was that when this was first looked at in the early 2000s, a lot of conservation organisations thought our problems are over because the cavalry is going to come over the hill bearing a huge sack of money from the NHS and say, well done, guys, you're doing a fantastic job. Here's a lot of money for you. And of course, it doesn't work like that. Everyone says, yeah, really interesting. Wildlife gives you health. Great. Get on with it. And the exception that probably are the lottery. The lottery do recognise what we're trying to do there and they've been really helpful and they are really interested. And I say with some of the work, um, I had a, a researcher, research, postgraduate research student who worked with me on this, who was very good at uh, accessing census data 
we can show in great detail how the work of an organization like the RSPB impacts on local communities. And we can show when it's actually addressing those people most in need, which I think is fantastic. I mean, it's just wonderful. There's a, there's a question from, 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 from Christine, which, which is, um, 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 what happened to the, um, spo to, to, to the spoil from, from, from the site? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Some of the material that you get is relatively benign and can be used for shaping land masses. So it actually gives you your contours and your hills and the humps and hollows. Some of the stuff is very, very nasty and has to be disposed of safely. I was involved in the Lower Don Valley, which was the industrial heartland. I mean, it was one of the biggest, probably the second biggest steel manufacturing location in Europe, so possibly in the world at one point. And that ran about three miles from Sheffield city centre to where the M1 motorway crosses. Um, and when they started, I mean, we had industry from about 12, 1300, but the serious big industry was from about 16, 1700. And they didn't bother what they put where, they didn't record any, but they just stuck any waste, went in the river or out the back. And the toxicity of the sediments down the Don Valley used to, we did all the testing for it, and it varied from square metre to square metre, what you'd actually got. It could be quite okay-ish. I mean, I showed that picture of what was Tinsley Park. I showed there a photograph of an area with a spoil heap, and I say it's about half a mile across. And that's got everything in it. It had uh, you know, sort of mercury, zinc, lead, cadmium, chrome, um, anything you want, it, it was in there. A dash of dioxin in the rivers. It was horribly, horribly toxic. Now, stuff like that, you either try and take it away and recycle it, which we are relatively good at doing now, or to put it crudely, you dig a big hole which you hope is watertight and you dump it all in the hole and then you seal the hole with concrete or clay and a liner and you seal it out of the way and there are some sites I know not far from if you go at the motorway where the cooling towers used to be on the right hand side um, there used to be a very funny shaped hill and it's a funny shaped hill because it was a, a landfill and it was a landfill so this is again this is only about two miles from Old Moor um, and it was a, a post-World War I landfill where they put the munitions that Sheffield manufactured, they put the waste material from the munitions works into that landfill unrecorded and it's not a water, it's not sealed, it's not hydrologically sealed. So it's, it doesn't leach out because the top of the landfill is covered with clay so there's nothing leaching through. But if, they, if it ever does, then you have a big, big catastrophe. And that's a little bit like one of the, the, the London site that someone mentioned earlier that the RSPB took on, which was derelict site uh, on the Thames. And I think at least one of those sites had a lot of munition stuff on it. And that is really unpleasant stuff to deal with. With the colliery, it's generally that you've got coking works and you get all the, the chemical byproducts from that um, and it's horrible. So on the one hand, the, some of the spoil simply becomes the landscape that you see around it and the nasty stuff really has to be dealt with very, very carefully, very carefully indeed. Some of the, quite a lot of the water courses, unfortunately, still have high levels of toxic chemicals in the sediments, not in the water, the water's clean. I mean, the River Don and the River Robert, we've got 12 or 14 species of fish, including trout and salmon, back in. But in the floodplain, where the toxic waters have occasionally spilled out in a flood incident, they've tipped onto that floodplain all the toxicity that was there, say, in the 17, 18 or 1900s. And that is really quite nasty stuff. And there are some hot spots. When, when you're an ecologist, you, you get an eye for spotting really bad contamination. And I had one site where I, 
um, a colleague from a consultancy had a team going on site to do some remediation. And I phoned him up at the time and said, look, you need to just have a look because I think it's badly contaminated. And within a day, they got everybody off site. It was a full bodysuit job. Really not nice stuff. Just ask Ian if the Environment Agency recognised the green infrastructure as uh, examples of nat nat natural flood management. Yes, they do. Um, I think basically because the models are there, the evidence is there, they understand that we can do an economic model which the Treasury accepts in terms of, you know, we can calculate, we can give an ecosystem value, the worth of say a, a floodplain wetland. To say it's not real money, but it gives you a comparative value that you can use for planning and compensation purposes. The problem we had with the Environment Agency with the, the most recent flooding was that we, how can I put this? One of the arguments that we've made is that the flooding occurring downstream in places like Fish Lake and Doncaster and to some extent in the Dern is a result of changes in the, in the landscape, catastrophic changes. Now the Dern is different from the other rivers because it doesn't rise on the moors. It's actually, it rises relatively far from the, the Pennine moors. But the other rivers like the Don and the Shee, actually their toehold is into the moors and the peat bogs of the peat district. And historically we drained and removed those. So the great mass of sphagnum bog that should be holding water when it rains in the Pennines doesn't hold it. And what happens instead is that the flood waters rush downstream and the flood gathers space as you go further downstream. And when you get to Fish Lake, where it used to be extensive fenland, properties and farmland now flood catastrophically. And where we had a problem with the environment agencies, they said, with the last flooding, that what happens at the top of the catchment didn't have any impact on the lower part of the catchment, <laughs> which is just bonkers. Oh, and I, no. did a thing, I did a thing on BBC with Paul Hudson, who's one of the BBC weathermen, and we kind of went down the catchment and looked at it, and just, it's just crazy. And the reason they were saying that was because they'd done a lot of remedial work in Sheffield, which stopped properties flooding, but it didn't hold the water back. No. And on a small scale, it made it worse. And the people of Fish Lake were saying, oh, so Sheffield didn't flood, but we did. The rain fell on Sheffield, not on us, but we got very wet. Explain that, please. <laughs> and, well, they are you know, supposed to take a whole catchment view, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. They... But they were trying to make out that the catchment doesn't function in our view as a catchment, which is just nonsense. Mm -hmm. And they were just, I think they were just a bit worried about someone saying, oh, right. So you've caused the flooding, <laughs> which isn't the case. I mean, the flooding was happening for bigger reasons than that. But even so, to say that the catchment doesn't function like that is a bit silly. <laughs> In my humble opinion, I have to say. <laughs> Any more questions? Comment. We've been asked to avoid all going to the seaside for our holidays and maybe try the cities. So I think after that, you may well be inundated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I say, I mean, the ones I would recommend in terms of more urban and post-industrial settings, obviously Furban, it's not urban really, but it's, it's a, a post-industrial site is, is wonderful. Old Moor and those areas are fantastic. And you've also got a suite of other sites, which are not RSBB, but are Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, like Old Denneby, which is nearby, and Pottery Car, which has got fantastic facilities. One of my frustrations, and I, I can say this, I mean, I, I know you're all, you know, RSPB members group, and I'm a life member of the RSPB and the Wildlife Trust, but the organizations don't talk to each other and they don't collaborate in marketing. And when I do tourism, what we're looking for is to market an area. And we want people to come, we want people to visit, we want people to enjoy it, we want people to come back, we want people to tell other people how wonderful it is. 
and it doesn't matter from our point of view if they go to Oldmore, Pottrick, Denaby, Thornmoors, or whichever size, but we want them to come and enjoy it. And the other thing that you're trying to do in tourism development, which is hugely important in terms of the economy, is you're trying to grow a local visit to a day visit, a day visit to an overnight stop, an overnight stop to a weekend break, a weekend break to a week. Your economic impact grows exponentially with that. So that's kind of the, the golden chalice that we're all chasing. And that requires all the organizations to say, let's promote, visit this area for your bird watching, visit this area for your natural history. We've got the Transpennine Trail, so you can link all these sites together, which we do. Let's market them together. But if you go to Oldmore, I bet you won't find anything that says, here's Pottery Car. And if you go to Pottery Car, you won't have anything that says, go to Oldmore. And yet, as the, as the, mm -hmm. the punter, as the visitor, what you want is information. You know, you go to a new place, you want to know what there is, where it is, how to get there, you know, how do I find out about it? What's uh, I just found that very annoying. I mean, if you do come at this way, the other place to, to look at now is the Yorkshire Wildlife Park, which you might think is not, you know, it's not really something for the RSPB, but there's a very, very nice wildlife park just off the M18, uh, on the other side of the M18 to Pottery Car. Um, and anyone with kids or grandkids, that is a wonderful day out. And they do some fantastic conservation work. They rescue abandoned tigers and things from around the world and recuperate them. So we've got all that happening as well. And it, it's all, you know, it's when people are visiting, they want to know what's available. And we, we've looked at things where you um, link thing like, things like heritage visiting to wildlife visiting to historic gardens and stuff like that. Um, but the frustration is trying to get, you know, Natural England, RSPP, Wildlife Trust, English Heritage, National Trust and all the others to speak to each other. They all work in silos. They do. I know I shouldn't say it. I shouldn't say it, but they do. Um, and, I love them all dearly, but they do. <laughs> but they're, they're, a lot of them are, are not commercial. They're not entrepreneurial. Um, they're specifically scientific. Yeah. And yeah. they're not particularly encouraged to look at a more holistic solution for a whole community. I mean, not that you'd expect them to, but I think that's why no, it happens. No. I mean, we did a talk... We had the national meeting of the Wildlife Trust, this is quite a few years ago, about the time we were doing the first project at Durham Valley. And people wanted to know how to do economic appraisals. And there's lots of economic studies done. I'm, I'm not bothered with the details, but a lot of them are done and they are completely wrong. You simply can't do them the way people do them. Um, and I've got some, some economists that I was working with who were very, very good on this. And we were asked to do a presentation to the um, chief executives, directors, and conservation officers of all the wildlife trusts, so nearly 50 organisations. Very good. And you could hear, you could hear them switching off as soon as we said we're going to talk about economic valuation. <laughs> they were all starting to go. And I just said, look, whether you like it or not, you know, I know most of you have come into this because you love bitterns or you love otters or you, you know, that's, that's what you want to do or you like communicating about them. But it has to be paid for. All that you're doing has to be paid for and all that you do has an impact. If you employ people, that's creating jobs, but it's also creating jobs because those people are employed and they spend money in the local economy. If you have visitors, those visitors come. And we, we did all the headline figures for Old Law. It, visitors come, they spend money, that creates jobs. Those jobs create more jobs. You're having that impact. All we're saying is you should try and maximise that impact and also shout to politicians and others about what you're doing because they might give a nod because we've got the bitten back. But I'll tell you what, if you say we've created 200 jobs in the Barnsley economy, they will give you more than a nod. They will understand that. That actually opens doors that actually transforms their interest they will say oh okay this is a serious business so but i could i could just feel them they're all going to sleep i could tell <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay then, Jeremy. Um, yes. So, um, shall I? Uh, 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 or? I think I think so. There's nothing that was come through on chat. So, um, uh, so 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 so. Uh, well, we've fascinating good, talk here. Good run of questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, really interesting. Um, and it's nice to get that all round view of a development. I've been in a previous existence involved in a couple of transformative projects when I worked for Thames Water. Uh, one was the one you've been talking about, which yeah. is the Barnes development in southwest London with WWT and also the clean-up of the Thames and the return of the salmon. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, nothing like the, um, well, dereliction that you've got up in Sheffield area and the contrast. Yeah. But it's nice to see successful projects. And it's especially interesting to get that holistic view of how it fits into the community. And as you say, without the economic arguments, you're never going to win the political ones. No, no. So on behalf of everyone, uh, absolutely fascinating evening. And in the old fashioned way, if we could all clap. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Nice to Thanks. see you all. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, take care. I'll just uh, finish off for the uh, membership that uh, just to remind everyone, that our next talk is on the 11th of May with uh, Richard Baines, a professional ecologist, and he's going to talk about the birds of Bhutan, um, which I myself visited about three, four years ago. It is absolutely marvellous place, and let alone the bird life, the culture, the scenery and so on. And he's livened it up a bit by calling it the land of the thunder dragon but whether we see them or not, I don't know. But uh, thank you all very much and goodbye. Thank you.